So I got an email a couple of nights ago from master trading coach and mentor Mike Bellafuri, partner at SMB Capital. And he asked me if the market has bottomed for 2022. Now, he didn't put it in those words. He said, Spencer, is the downtrend over in markets, biotech, semis, Qs, spies? And if it's not over, what do you want to see for it to be over? So, of course, if Bella sends me an email and asks me a couple of questions about the market and tells me he wants me to do a video, who am I to say no? When I see a question like, is the downtrend over? And then he rattles off these um, different ETFs. And basically, when we're, when we're talking about those ETFs, they're just segments of the market. When I'm thinking of the, when I talk about the market, when you hear me talk about the market, I'm generally referring to the S&P 500. I think that's what most people consider the market in the United States. It's the large cap stocks. It's diverse index, covers all the different segments, technology, real estate, consumer staples, cyclicals, energy, financials. So it gives you a really good picture of, you know, overall what are stocks doing. And then those other things in there, whether it's the Qs, which is large cap technology. Um, you know, I look, when I think about the Qs, I think of higher growth, the best financial structures, meaning they don't really have debt, those companies, or if they do, they've taken it on for, for other purposes than they actually really need it to run the company. Um, to buy back shares or something like that. Another a kind of a backhanded way to uh, return capital to, to, to shareholders. Um, SMH, which is a segment, that's the chip maker semiconductors. That's a segment of the Qs. So it's always good to take a look at that because there's a bunch of names that are in the SMH that we can trade that are very liquid, tend to have pretty good volatility. As short-term day traders, that's great. Um, Biotechsy asked me about, we're gonna look at the XBI index. Um, that's gonna be, more speculative money, longer payoff time. How many times do we see these small biotechs where we come in in the morning down 20%, down 40%, down 50% because um, high risk, high reward. And then finally, the ultimate, and when he asked me about growth stocks, I use RK as the proxy. Also more speculative money. Um, they're gonna have names in there that might not pay off for three, five years, even a decade. Um, they think Zoom has, a, they put a $1,500 price target on Zoom. It's a $100 stock. You know, what are they thinking there? Well, they think the work from home trend will continue over the next decade and their earnings will 10X or 20X, et cetera. Um, but that's gonna be more speculative money. To me, the least speculative money, um, although there's can be high multiples, is gonna be in the queues just because of the financial structure. Very high cash flow, grows 20, 30% a year. Um, and I guess the least risky people think about it in terms of the spies because of that diversity. You know, even though there's a heavy component of the Q names, the, hot, the large cap technology, maybe one of you guys knows what the percentages are. I don't follow those as closely as I used to, but large cap tech is gonna dominate the spies. But you also have energy in there. That, you know, why, was, why were the spies holding up better than the Qs when the Qs were dropping 30, 35, 40% this year? Well, there's energy in there, right? Energy is just, energy was gangbusters and everyone piled in and then they kind of did a rug pull. Um, and that, that rug pull in energy, by the way, kind of helped the market, I think, bottom overall. Um, you know, everything basically, at this point, is there anything left to hit? If you want to learn three more real-world setups that our traders use, including the simple setup that we teach all of our new traders, and the setup that turned one of our traders into a seven-figure big money earner, check out the free webinar that we're currently running. Just go ahead and click the link that should be appearing now at the top right-hand corner of your screen. That will open up the free registration page in a new window, so don't worry, you won't lose this video. You can also visit tradingworkshop.com to register for this free intensive workshop. You're gonna learn more in a couple of hours from this trading workshop than from years of online education. The speculative growth names, the biotech and the Oryx got obliterated last year in 2021. Um, it wasn't until 2022 where the Qs finally took it in the chin and then ultimately the spies took it in the chin as well as financials and energy rolled over. Um, et cetera. So when we're talking about, you know, when Mike asked me about are the, you know, are, are we still in these downtrends, um, I think it's important to recognize, like, what is a downtrend or what is an uptrend? It's giving you an idea of who is, you know, who has the momentum, who has control of 
the market and the time frame that we're looking at. Now understand, SMB is a short-term trading desk. 70, 80% of our trading monthly is gonna be based on what's going on intraday. Sure, we're gonna look at swing, we're gonna look at swing positions, but that's gonna depend on market conditions. If we're in a choppy up and down market, we certainly do not want to be having a lot of energy and time and mental energy spent on swing trades. But if we're in a market that's come off a ton over the last few months and showing signs of bottoming, and showing signs of turning back to the upside, maybe we will be looking more for swing positions on the long side at least. At least. Swing positions on the short side are a little bit trickier, right? Because markets tend to go down very quickly and you have this V response. So guys on the desk will put swing positions on the short side, but it's very different than as more setups occur on the long side, putting on a swing position is a little bit different. It'll be a little bit slower. Notice over the last week as things started to play out, when things started to move higher, um, we put in some higher levels, some higher levels, higher levels, and then finally today, maybe a little bit of a short-term kind of blow, blow offish top um, earlier in the day, we'll see. Um, but it's different putting on a swing long position than a swing short position. Um, tends to be more dangerous anytime um, be in, on the short side because, well, number one, any company can get taken over at any time. Uh, and even in this environment, um, we still see deals announced. Um, <laughs> I'm chuckling to myself because I'm thinking about the Twitter deal, which was a wild card. Someone like Musk coming along who could afford to take the company private. Um, and the types of setups, you know, that we're going to look for um, in a downtrend channel, um, we're not really looking, even on an intraday basis, we're not, unless we have a very strong catalyst that particular day, we're not looking so much for a breakout to the upside. Long trades are more about oh, that stock put in a low yesterday, it retested the low the next day, it looks like it's bottoming, maybe we can catch kind of a curl up long trade as opposed to on day five, it, you know, it's looking really strong, I'm going to chase it here. Those are usually the, like, the long trades that don't work um, in, in, a, in an environment, in a, down, a broader downtrend environment. So let's take a look at the SPIs, the Qs, SMH, XBI, and ARC, which I think covered the segments that uh, Bell had asked me to take a look at and, and kind of see where we are. So the first one, as I mentioned earlier, is the SPIs, the S&P 500. Um, we're looking at maybe about two years here on the daily chart. And what we can see is 2021 was just a very methodical, slow uptrending year, uptrending channel. You can see kind of those little pullbacks were like three to 5%. The strongest pullback we saw was in the fall that probably was around five or 6%. Um, actually took out the bottom of the channel before moving back inside of it into the end of the year. And then coming into January, um, we started to see some selling pressure. You'll quite often see selling come into the market at particular times of the year based on people's vacation schedules, managers quarterly, trying to make their quarterly numbers. The two most common ones I've seen probably the last five, six, seven years is this Labor Day sell-off thing where people come back from the beach and we just, after Labor Day, the market gets hammered. I feel like we've seen that two or three times in the last five or six years. Um, and then the other one is, in this case, uh, we had a strong year in 2021 and the managers did their best to secure their bonuses for a Q4 in the year to push it up into year end. And little did I know, like I was expecting a pullback in the first half of January, little did I know it was gonna lead to kind of the largest bear market we've seen I don't know, many, many years. Certainly, yeah, probably in the, in the entire um, secular bull market of the last 10, 11 years. Um, and we'll see if this ends up being the end of the secular bull. My base case is it is not. This is just, this is just gonna be a little bit longer. Um, the last cyclical bear market that lasted 12 months plus, if you go back to 2014, so go back and look at Q4 of 2014, and then look at up until Q1 of 2016, that was a nice, it was a nice cyclical bear market. In the first few years of the, the overall secular bull market, and so it was in the first few years, so easier to predict that that was going to resolve to the upside. We were starting from much lower prices. 10, 11 years in, you know, it's a little bit, you know, jury, jury's out. We'll see over the next 12 months what happens. Um, but coming, you know, a month or two into it, you can kind of see that down move in January was very strong. We rallied back hard and then Russia invaded Ukraine, which led to a lower low, um, and then a very violent uh, move up in early to mid-March, which then kind of formed that, that downtrend, which we haven't touched again on the spies. And so the downtrend has not, is not, uh, that downtrend has not 
kind of been broken in the spies and may not break. We'll see over what happens over the next few months, depending on you know July's earnings season and then the October earnings season. Um, I suppose if the July earnings season is extremely strong, and then the inflation numbers that come out in July for June have a dramatic push to the downside, that could get us back to that trend. But right now we're looking at kind of the most recent trend off of the um, kind of the April May little bounce. I guess the April bounce that failed to resolve to the upside, and then the the May CPI, kind of that gap, gap, gap. That was, we started to sell off in front of the CPI. The CPI happened, it was bad. We had another gap, we, and then we had another. And that put in the bottom for the spies. And that could hold for quite some time in order for that to break. And so, so when Mike asked me about the kind of the trend, I don't, you know, it's gonna depend. We'll look at all these other, it's gonna look different depending on the ETF we look at. Um, certainly the spies, um, with the weakness in energy, the weakness in financials, um, it's been having a tougher time than the Qs, and we'll get to that in a second. Um, but in terms of the low, there's a reasonably good chance the low for the spies are in for a while. I think you're going to have to see um, that CPI number that comes out next month look not good and the Fed get more aggressive. Remember, there's a backdrop of things that are causing these things, right? Earnings ultimately is going to be a large driving influence. This year is the year of the macro. What is the year of the macro? Well, certainly a huge spike in energy prices. Like energy prices were already going up, and then um, Russia invading Ukraine added fuel to the fire, but I think if you look at the numbers, maybe you guys are more familiar with these now than I am. I think, I feel like energy prices have come back down to where they were on the, maybe someone knows this, have, ha, are energy prices below where they were when Russia went into Ukraine? I feel like maybe they're right about where, where it started or not. You guys probably should know this because you guys are young and hungry and, and should be following all these things. Um, but 2022 has been the year of the macro where macro hadn't mattered for a number of years except for a, a week here or a month there. That's, you know, it's been the controlling theme of the market, but ultimately the macro is only gonna matter so much. Like, you know, if earnings are not collapsing, which they're definitely are not, if earnings stay strong and the guide downs from large companies are not aggressive, we're seeing some guide downs, but not too aggressive, um, we will hold lows. And we started to see signs, I think four or six weeks ago where we saw these guide downs, we should probably take a look at, um, look at the cues because what we saw over the last month or two is I think it started with Microsoft which they said some sort of minor warning and then we saw it with like Adobe and maybe Nvidia I think those were the first three and for those of you I don't know if you guys were still in the morning meetings at that point but I was like ooh so these companies are guiding down but they're they're going their initial reaction in the after hours were lower but but then the next day they would be positive that's the first thing you look for kind of once you know, the Qs, I think, were maybe down 35, 40% from the highs, something like that. And that hit in middle of June, right? So the low was middle of June. And then you start to see these warnings. And then the warnings not leading to further downside. Um, and it also, we had, the, we, had the, um, we had the luxury of that, just that triple down move from the May CPI number, where people started to sell in front of the CPI because they, they sensed the number was going to be bad. And then we had a gap down on the number. And then we had... Um, a bottom a couple of days later. And so that's, we're now five, six weeks into it. And what you can see is I've highlighted on the cues. And so you see on the daily, that downtrend um, that started in the high 300s, not quite the, the all time high. It's the downtrend that started after March bounce, um, where we, we bounced from 320 on the cues all the way back up to, I feel like 370, maybe 372. Um, which was, I thought that was about as high as we could get before, you know, you were going to be in trouble if you started to short and we actually didn't fail there. And like as normally does, things look really strong at the top. We had one gap down and that was the beginning of the downtrend. Um, um, coming into to the middle of May, we had the next bounce where it was a little bit shallower than the bounce from March and we broke to the downside there and that, like that's the bottom. Like the bottom is in for the cues. I know people were talking about us taking out like that uh, 270 area and going down to 240. We still could hit that later in the year. It's going to take large, you know, think about what does it have to happen for, for that to, to occur. Well, you're going to have to see growth decelerate strongly. That's going to be earnings warnings from, you know, Amazon, Microsoft, uh, Google, um, it's not, you're not going to see it in Tesla. Tesla's not going to warn they're going to beat and raise. Well, they don't raise. They just give, they give very long-term guidance and they let 
kind of the Wall Street try to figure it out, and Wall Street's really bad at figuring it out. And so they beat, I don't know, each quarter, what, 35% on average for the last couple of years? Um, those beats, unless the numbers go up for Tesla, will be even bigger. But some of those other names, um, depending on whether we see a slowdown in, in, in cloud computing, whether we see a slowdown in consumer spending, will impact some of those other names. Um, um, but if we don't see that, it's going to be very hard to have that, that leg down um, below the low from middle of June. But getting to the point in technology, what you see is once you do have that bottom in the middle of June and you rally back up very quickly and it fails, and we start to move sideways there like around 280, um, I've circled two points on the queues there. Um, three days in the beginning of July and two days in the middle of July. Um, what you can see there is, I don't remember what was going on at the beginning of July where we kind of rolled over and we failed to close below 280 there, but that's what I'm paying attention to. When the market's down 30, 40%, or in this case, you know, large cap technologies, that's the market I'm referring to, I'm thinking about more about upside than downside. In the back of my mind, I understand things can go lower, but they've gone down so much already, and the inflation data is already out for the month of May, and unless we see some sort of disaster for the month of June, which we did actually see not a great number, but what was the reaction for the June number? The reaction was we didn't take out the lows from the beginning of July, and then we gapped higher um, a couple of days later. To me, that's like lows are in for technology, are we going to bounce back up to 305 to 310 where we broke down from uh, in the middle of June? And as we get stronger each day, I'm going to be thinking more about being comfortable buying into strength intraday, holding swing long positions multi-day. And that's what the importance of, when Mike's saying, is the downtrend over? He's basically saying to me, are you going to start to shift in terms of what are the setups you're looking for and the risk that you're willing to take on the long side both on an intraday and a multi-day level, a multi-day setup. Um, understanding that the multi-day is going to be more important for that question, answer, the answer to that question, than the intraday. Um, intraday is more about, you're definitely going to take, depending on the catalyst, long and short setups intraday, even if there's a bigger picture downtrend. It's just going to be what's your willingness to chase strength probably at a, on the open or, or in the middle of the day or something like that. If, you know, in the case of the queues, now that we've kind of taken out those two bounce highs from a month ago and we're moving higher today, you're going to feel a little bit better about chasing something above a key resistance level um, at 10 o'clock, um, even in the middle of the day when the volume is lighter because, you know, technology is, is strong right there. Let's, let's move on to the next. Um, so he asked about the semis. That's represented as SMH. To me, SMH is a little bit, you know, down 40% from the high I highlighted in the chart there. But today, you can kind of see it's now gotten back to the top of the uptrend channel. I'm not so much. I didn't punch up the AMD today. I, do, I will say this, just as a, a completely an, an aside for an important short-term uh, setup intraday on a catalyst. I don't know if you guys looked at ASML, um, where they kind of guided a little bit. You, normally, I don't talk about ASML in the morning meeting because it's the home market is, I don't know, the Netherlands maybe. It's not. It's Europe somewhere. Um, it's not the U.S. So I tend to shy away from like ADRs talking about them in the morning meeting. But what they said, it was gapping lower. They said they lowered guidance, but you have to understand nuance. Um, they they lowered guidance because some of the deals were pushed back to 2023. They didn't lower guidance because they said they were seeing a slowdown in spending. To me, that's a setup on a gap lower where I might look for a bounce for it to go positive. Whereas it was kind of the opposite of the setup for a, what's the ticker, ABV, ABBV, or it was on the morning game plan sheet. Um, but they, the headline was they guided higher, but they didn't guide higher. They beat by like 20 cents for the quarter and then they guided up 10 cents. That's actually a guide down. And so I would look for that to actually roll over. You gotta go a little bit deeper than, than the surface than just kind of the headline thing there because that can actually help you after, right after the open in terms of how things reverse or continue in the other direction. So getting back to SMH, the semis really were extremely weak, especially um, in that CPI. And I think to me that's a signal that there's going to be a slowdown, you know, maybe in cloud spending, that's going to be a, sl a slowdown. Maybe there's a glut. Um, a lot of companies overspent because the supply chain issues and they were worried we're not going to be able to get our chips. I'm sure you've seen stories about that. I've seen a couple of headlines about that the last couple of weeks. Um, 
whether it's in the automotive space, whether it's you know, um, corporations overspending on technology, and now there's a glut. And so um, we saw a lot of weakness in, in SM, SMH. And so we're gonna actually find out probably in the next two weeks based on guidance um, on a lot of these companies that from not only the chip companies, but the companies that spend on the chips, you want to pay it that, that that's second order effects, right? Like the, you know, the, the cell phone providing companies, the, the, um, the cloud providers, the Googles, the Amazons, the Microsofts, those are the three big ones that provide cloud. What are they, what are they saying about their spending? All of a sudden you're going to see a reaction in AMAT. You're going to see a reaction in MU. You're going to see a reaction in SWKS, some of these um, chip names, depending on what the, the people who spend the money on those chips um, are, are saying in their, 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 their quarterly calls. And so I'd be very careful um, about chasing semis right here. Um, you know, this is the third time it's gone to the top of the channel. I'd want to see it have a few closes you know, near the top of the channel, kind of like what it did the prior time where it bounced there and then resolve to the upside. Maybe that you will get a catalyst out of that, but right here I'd be pretty cautious about being long. Um, then on the other hand, um, XBI, which is one of the biotech ETFs, um, that is way below the uptrend, downtrend that was established from the top. There's a lot of room there. Um, and remember, downtrends and uptrends, that tells us kind of who has more force with directionally speaking. So, you know, downtrend XBI long term, if that starts consolidating and breaks to the downside, I'm going to be more aggressive on the short as opposed to something as it moves, as it starts to move higher on the setup on the long side. But at the same time, um, when there's a big distance from that larger, bigger picture downtrend, I'm going to be focused on support and resistance levels. I've said this many times before. I've tweeted this. I've blogged it. I've said it in morning meetings. There's nothing more important in short-term trading than understanding support and resistance areas. Why is that just like, it's not just like some magic thing. It's because human psychology, when you start to get back to areas where people are at break even, where they're losing less money, they're like, holy shit, I'm not down a ton of money now. I'm going to get out. And then other people are like, you know, see the stock start to roll over a little bit in that area. And they're just like, oh, I don't want to lose money again. There was so much pain there. Then other people see it rolling over. Professionals say, let's short here. And then all of a sudden things start to roll over and then you know, all of those things come, come together. So support and resistance levels, very important. And if you're coming into a prior support and resistance area, when you're trending lower and you're starting to bounce and you get up like this, is, this has some room kind of to that next um, prior support area where it broke down and put in that final low, um, if it gets to that area and doesn't hesitate and kind of goes right through, that kind of tells you what the psychology is. People who got long there probably got blown out so much in that just massive down move, like that where we put in the lows and the volume hit the highs, I guess. I don't know if that was April or May. But, um, oh, those people aren't there. We really don't, um, we've got a lot more upside to the next kind of, where that next resistance support area actually hits the longer term downtrend. That's the spot. And then if you're actually through those resistance areas, that kind of, that coincides where it dice, you see where it's dissecting kind of the, the uppermost big line there at the, the 100 level, I guess, 98, 100, something like that, that there, um, then all of a sudden you might be actually in a longer term, starting a longer term uptrend. You know, we'll, we'll see like in the coming months if it gets there, like what, that, what that's all about. It'll be interesting to see. And then finally, kind of the longer term arc, most speculative. Um, it put in the low at the beginning of May. It actually was the volume high, I guess. Um, and then you put in your higher low, I guess, mid-June, it looks like. Um, and then we've tested a few times that resistance area. I think everyone's kind of given, one of the good things about ARC at this point is people have probably kind of given up in terms of playing that for a bounce. Um, the people who are going to hold it never sell. They held it and they're probably not really looking at it. The professionals are probably seeing this chart here and seeing those resistance areas that just got taken out. Um, oh, and also it looks like it did just break that trend as well. So it's broken, the, it's broken this longer term downtrend. Um, the shallower downtrend, which I, know I didn't extend to kind of where we are now, probably is, I want to say, probably comes into the low, mid to low 50s. Um, that to me would be the most obvious thing at ARC. Where it is from today, it probably has another 10 to 15% of upside to the next resistance and that kind of, that shallower downtrend. Um, and by the way, like 
to me, like the cues, which have been really strong for the last couple of weeks and, and really kind of telegraphing that they were going to work their way back up to 300 and ultimately to where they broke down from that 305, 306 area. When people see that and they missed it, um, they're like, what can I buy? Oh, look at ARC. ARC just broke the downtrend. ARC is above resistance from the last month or two. It's a little bit more, spe and people are just feeling a little bit more co confident and cocky um, because they, you know, they, they see what the Qs have done. The Qs are now 8 or 9% off the lows, or maybe more. They're, they're pretty far off the lows at this point, maybe 12% off the lows or something. Um, and the more speculative names, the ARCs, the XBIs, um, that's like kind of third or fourth year buying. You will get some at the lows, like some reaction buying in those names, but the sustained trend to the upside, like kind of what we've seen in the queues now, that takes people feeling a little bit more confident. We've seen a couple of buying into a couple of weekends, like let's see what happens this weekend. If people buy again into this weekend, they're going to feel a little bit better, and then you're going to start to see better moves in some of the more speculative names, higher multiple names, which by the way, their multiples aren't particularly high um, when you compare their growth rates. Um, I mean, that's what happens in a cyclical bear, cyclical bear market. Those, those multiples compress quite a bit. Um, and that's what creates kind of these, the, these new uptrends. I think that's pretty much all, all what I want to say. But the idea generally being on a trading desk is we ask this question, you know, are there differences between these different ETFs um, which have been the strongest, you know, the last few days, the last week? I'm going to focus my attention there. Now when I'm seeing two or three of these things start to act strong, what are the ones that might play catch up over the next week or two? And then we'll start to move our energy there. And understand, um, as we see that shift in momentum, swing longs become less risky, more palatable. Um, and playing initial weakness short stuff on the short side might be good intraday, but maybe I'm going to be a little bit more careful on the multi-day shorts as well as we're seeing more and more things bottom and people get more appetite on the long side. Hey, go ahead and click our subscribe button so you don't miss any of the videos they're producing for you in the trading community. And please take the time to add your feedback in the comments section for what videos you'd like for us to produce next and what you found helpful from this video from all of us at SMB. Train and trade well.